Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Hope everyone is well. This time of year, the uh, this fear, this hint of autumn enters into the air. That's, I find that um, I don't know if encouraging is the right word. It feels a little encouraging. I'm not sure. Um, not sure why. But, uh, I hope you're uh, enjoying that, especially after the heat. It feels pretty good. Just invite people if you if you like to move at all to be able to see better. Please feel uh, feel free to do that. So this morning I'd like to start talking about generosity. Over the past several months, really since uh, I think almost since COVID began, I've been giving a series of talks on the six perfections, which are one of the oldest formulations of uh, Buddhist practice uh, within the Mahayana tradition, and. It was kind of coincidental that we started, we started where we did, started with patience, really. That wasn't coincidental. That was what, where we were, right? Forbearing um, something difficult to, uh, to bear. And then uh, work from there to zeal, uh, to meditation, uh, and to wisdom. What is a, a kind of a coincidence is that Obon uh, and the, the talks I gave a couple weeks ago, and then the talk last week about, uh, about Obon at Zen Shuji, uh, had to do with generosity. It had to do with making offerings. And we're going to the front of the line of the six perfections that starts with generosity. We, when I started the talks, we started in the middle. So we're uh, there at generosity. Usually, we're talking about generosity uh, during the month of October, because that's the month where we uh, practice the, the offerings to the hungry ghosts. Uh, so we'll probably get back to it then again, but I wanted to uh, talk this morning a little bit about generosity and then particularly how it relates to the stories that uh, I told uh, the past couple weeks about uh, Mukuran and Mogali and then also about uh, the noble woman who was making offerings for her mother who had been reborn in hell, who later became uh, Jizo Bodhisattva. When I think about generosity, you know, really of the perfections, generosity is my favorite. It's so straightforward. It's so uncomplicated. I mean, the practice of it can get complicated, but the teaching itself is so straightforward. The way that it can align our lives is so profound. Uh, Dogen Zenji, the founder of this school uh, in Japan, uh, said, without coveting reward or thanks from others, we simply share our strength with them. He's talking about the practice of generosity. Without coveting reward or thanks, we simply share our strength. It's a remarkable medicine. And to share our strength, that's the, that's the heart of it. But to take care of that heart, to take care of the heart that shares its strength with others. We have to endeavor to not covet reward or thanks. I think we can all feel how when you do share your strength with somebody, I don't know about you, usually I'm waiting a little bit for the thank you. Right? No, that's not all bad. I think it's good we thank each other. But he's saying let go of that. Let go of the coveting of thanks, uh, of reward, and simply share uh, your strength. Remarkable medicine. When you practice that right, in material ways, in emotional ways, spiritual ways, uh, there's a release of self-grasping. And that self-grasping is the very thing which keeps us uh, in the mindset that we are independent beings that we are isolated, that we are alone. That to be able to make it in the world, we need to manipulate objects to be able to get along. It's the very heart of uh, ignorance. It causes us so much pain. So when we simply share our strength with others, the wholeness of being is revealed. I've been using this term wholeness in relationship to emptiness, like as a synonym of emptiness which I'll talk a little bit more about this morning. But our deep mutuality is revealed when we share our strength with, with each other or with other beings. Very immediate. 
and a guidance comes directly. It's not just that if we practice that way, our life will get better later on, although my experience is that it does. If we can find ways to be deeply generous uh, with our community, with our families, with the earth, uh, that our life gets better. We really know, we become more aware of how it is that we are receiving all the time. Because sharing our strength, while it's an outward movement, it's also an inward movement. It also is about receiving. So when we think about generosity, it's not just about what can I give, it's also what am I receiving. So sharing strength, receiving the strength of others, sharing what strength we have. Our life gets better when we do that. And our life is immediately better when we do that. It doesn't take any time to feel the release. Like when you give a present, I will encourage you to take this up as a practice. Just give something to somebody that you think, you don't, you don't have to be convinced that they need it even. Just enough, uh, just enough that uh, you think it might bring some delight to their heart. And see what it is to give it to them. And don't even look for them to change. Right? Don't look for the sign that they are delighted. Don't look for the thanks. Don't look for any reward at all. Just, just give it to them. And see what happens in your own heart. See how that movement outward moves this direction too. And the deep sincerity of our shared life is revealed uh, in that giving. Now that's the discipline of it. The actuality of it, you will notice. You will notice their delight. That's great. That's great. Or maybe they won't. <laughs> maybe you won't see it. No. But, um, but the, the discipline of it is to, to uh, let go of that coveting. But traditionally, if we talk about generosity, one of the core ways that it's understood uh, in Buddhism is the merit uh, that comes from uh, making offerings to the Sangha. So when we talk about practice of generosity, typically when I'm talking about it, I talk about it in a very broad way. About, um, about the giving and receiving that is our life for everyone, for everything. If we talk about it in a narrow context within Buddhism, dana is oftentimes uh, operationally defined as making offerings to the sangha, the sangha being what was referred to as a, is referred to as a field of merit. Because the sangha lives a life of relinquishing the fetters, relinquishing the things that block us, from really deeply understanding our interpenetration, the Sangha is thought of as being noble. Because the Sangha actualizes awakening to our deep mutuality, the Sangha is thought of as a field of merit. In the times of the Buddha, that Sangha would have referred to the renunciates that followed the Buddha and lived the exactly same life he did. And so oftentimes the... Um, the, the way that a non-renunciate could participate in that uh, was to bring an offering to the renunciate sangha and help support their life. They didn't do any work. Like, I mean, not just like they didn't get a job. I mean, like they didn't, nothing. No turning the soil over. I think there's only a few things you're allowed to do. You're allowed to mend your robes, filter water. I think that's about it, actually. Um, maybe chop firewood in certain situations, depending on where you lived. So they did, this sangha didn't do anything, right? So, uh, I mean, they did everything, but they didn't do like work, right? So the, um, the non-renunciates would support them by uh, bringing offerings, and there was a mutuality um, uh, there. And that's uh, reflected in our tradition still today, although it's changed, um, it's changed quite a bit. But the basic thing being there, that there is a merit that emerges from making the offering. Merit is something like good karma. It's karma that points towards liberation. It's karma that uh, helps guide us towards a life that can deeply realize our interconnectedness and live that out accordingly. So 
So in the last uh, uh, couple of stories that I told, uh, one about uh, Mokuren, who was one of the Buddha's disciples, foremost in spiritual power, that his parents passed away and he went looking for them and he found his mother in the realm of the hungry ghosts and he tried to save her. He tried to use a spiritual power to bring her nourishment there in the realm of the hungry ghosts, but it, it didn't work. She couldn't consume it. And he was distraught and he went to the Buddha and he said, what should I do? And the Buddha said, make an offering to the Sangha. The Sangha is about to finish its rains retreat, right? In the middle of July, July 15th. So make an offering. And the merit of that offering can be dedicated to your mother. And so he did. And she was freed from that realm of uh, the hungry ghosts. And Amokuren danced with joy. And that's where the Obon dancing comes from that some of you may be familiar with in the Japanese tradition. So there's a dedication of merit. And the Buddha said something to Mokuren very important. He said, your spiritual power alone will not be enough. You can't do it on your own by becoming powerful. You have to harness some other kind of energy. There's a kind of merit that's about liberation. That merit of liberation is what can save your mother. It's what can save you. It's what can save everyone. So that's what the Buddha invited him into in that making, uh, making offerings, practicing generosity. We saw something similar uh, happen with the noble daughter in the, the Sutra of um, Kshita Garbha or Jizo Bodhisattva, uh, where uh, uh, she makes offerings for her mother because she's afraid that her mother has, um, has fallen into an evil realm because her mom was kind of mean. I mean, it doesn't say exactly that way in the sutra, but that's what, kind of what it says. She was kind of mean. And so she's worried, like, what's going to happen to her in her next incarnation? And the Buddha speaks to her and says, I'll allow you to see her. I'll, allow you, uh, I'll show you a way, actually. He doesn't say allow. He says, I'll show you a way in which you can see where she is. And she goes, uh, she practices, she does, takes up that practice, and she finds herself in this hell realm. And she, a demon king comes to speak with her addresses her as a bodhisattva and says, why are, you, why are you here? And she says, well, I'm looking for my mother. He says, well, who's your mother? And she tells her and says, oh, she left here three days ago. Right? She left here three days ago because of the merit of her daughter, who is you, making offerings on her behalf. And not only was she released from the hell realm, on that day she was released, all of the beings in hell were also released. All of the beings. So notice that. Mokuran is told by the Buddha, your spiritual power that you want to apply by yourself cannot save your mother. It takes the merit of an offering to the Sangha to do that. And here, the merit of the offerings release all the beings, not just her mother. They, re they release everyone. Those are important parts of the story which I think we'll weave together here. Now, this dedication of merit, it's a fundamental practice in all forms of Buddhism. Except for possibly modern Western Buddhism. Which I think will catch up. I think we'll catch up. Maybe that's part of why I want to give this talk. <laughs> um, this is really fundamental, all the way back. Some people think, oh, in Theravadan Buddhism, they, don't, they must not do that. No, almost all of Theravadan Buddhism is people making offerings for the purposes of creating merit and dedicating that merit for various, uh, for various purposes. Uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, sometimes the emphasis is a little bit different, but it's really core. How do we, how do we create merit? And then how do we share it? Now, this teaching of dedication of merit can be really confusing, especially when we try to uh, square it with karma. Now, we have a very very clear teaching about karma. With whatever intention you carry in this moment, there will be an effect in the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. Cause and effect is real, is central. And when we take that teaching seriously, um, sometimes we start to hold it too rigidly, like we really understand what the cause and effect is in a very linear way. 
we start thinking about in a very linear way. Like I did this thing today, therefore this next thing's gonna happen tomorrow. Which that's one way to understand cause and effect, karmic cause and effect. But within Buddhism, I would say the karmic cause and effect is not so rigid. It's not so clear always how that's unfolding. It's more like spirals. It's more like cables winding around each other rather than just this kind of very rational, logical uh, cause and effect uh, relationship. There's room in there for the intention of each other to affect each other. And this is, um, this is really key to starting to understand what's happening with the dedication of marriage. The compassionate heart uh, knows two things which seem um, uh, at total odds with each other. And the first is that our suffering is together. When you feel deeply into suffering, you know that other beings are also suffering. When you resist suffering, you may think that you're the only one suffering. But when you embrace suffering, when you enter into it through compassion, you know that this suffering is shared. But you also know that it's yours. Those two things are not set against each other. Well, this is important because the teaching of karma uh, will teach us about that part that's just our own. And we're the only one that can face it. We're the only one that can do something about it. But without the other side, without the sharing, the rigidity of that um, doesn't work. The Buddha has to tell uh, um, Mukuren, your spiritual power is not enough. It takes the wholeness. Jizo Bodhisattva's mother uh, is um, uh, released with all beings. So that connection through compassion of the individual experience of suffering and the collective suffering is really important. We tend to take one side or the other. But the central question, how is merit shared? Like, what does that even mean? How could I share it? What do I do to share it? It's super easy. You just dedicate it. You just think to yourself, it's your intention. However it is that your ten intention is reflected, that maybe you just saying, like out loud, I dedicate the merit of this period of sitting uh, meditation uh, to the well-being uh, uh, of, of my friend, Genjo, who's returned from, from Japan. It's that, that easy. As I say that, the intention of my heart, right, something is released. You can feel it just immediately. Like, I'm not trying to accrue that, uh, that good karma for myself. Right? I'm giving it away. In fact, good karma that is grabbed onto is no longer good karma. <coughs> Merit is dynamic. It doesn't stop. You can't hold it. And so if you don't dedicate merit, it goes away. Right? You think it accrues to yourself. In a way it does, and maybe some good things will happen. But awakening doesn't happen. And it loses, it loses its power of liberation. It keeps us in the cycle. So whatever merit may come from my own practices, right? from my own uh, caring for others, for my own study, for my own meditation, for all the kind of things that I do that seem very buddhist -y, and all the kind of things I, seem, I do that aren't buddhist -y, right? that develop merit, I should dedicate them. I should give it away. Because in giving away the merit, the merit stays alive. Now why is that? Flip it 
flip the way you think about it. Flip the way that you think about merit. I do something and there's merit. Good merit comes from that. A good intention brings about good results, right? And you're thinking like, well, how could I give that intention to someone else? What I mean by flip it is, think about the actuality of our interdependence first. And then think about what happens when we, act, when we endeavor to act in accordance with that. When we endeavor to act in accordance with our deep inner penetration, when we endeavor to, to act that way, it is actualized. It's made real. The truth of our interdependence can be seen. Our activities can be um, supported by being able to see in that way. That's what good karma is. Good karma isn't like a, a knapsack of treats that you carry around. It's actually the transformation of how it is that your mind works. It's a transformation of how your heart works. It's a transformation of how your body works, how your spirit works. So that transformation we call good karma, and the transformation is one which is that, that something's being actualized. So the sharing of merit is the very fundamental nature of merit in the first place. Merit is merit because it's about sharing. My daughter Susky, that was she would love to say that. Sharing is caring. She would always say that, as she would relieve you of one of your spring rolls or something. <laughs> um, very sweet. Sharing is caring. But that's, well, that's where merit comes from. A deep understanding. I don't mean like intellectual understanding. I mean a deep lived understanding of how much it is that we all rely on each other. And as we, as we understand that and we start to act accordingly, the merit is simply that things are being transformed. The Buddha is telling Mokuran, this isn't about your power. This is something shared. And the very thing that was holding his mother in the hungry ghost realm was not knowing about sharing. That's why the hungry ghost can't eat. Right? Have you heard this, this very popular kind of folk story in Asia about the difference between heaven and hell? It's exactly the same place. It's a table uh, filled with all kinds of um, not wonderful delicacies. And uh, everybody that's there, um, they have chopsticks, but the chopsticks are really long and they're grafted to their hands. So their hands are just our chopsticks. And the chopsticks are so long you can't get anything in your own mouth. Right. So if you, if you see that scene in the hell incarnation, everyone's fighting, trying to get something in their mouth and making deals with each other about, I'll give you this one if you give me that one. And there are others. And heaven's a place everyone's just feeding each other. Oh, what do you want, Zoichi? Oh, yeah. What do you want, Shanae? Here, yeah. What do you want, Linda? That, that's, that's the, the uh, quality of heaven. Sharing. So the reason that merit can be shared is because that's the fundamental truth of it to begin with. The fundamental truth of it to begin with is our mutuality, our wholeness, the emptiness of an independent, isolated self. So, how does this relate back to um, our discussion of the paramitas? How is this activated by wisdom? That's always the, the, the conversation within, um, uh, within Prajna Paramita teachings. So if you go back to the dialectics of Prajna teaching that I, I was borrowing from um, the great Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, where he says, a tree is not a tree, therefore it is a tree. Go back to that teaching where we say, if we encounter a tree, a tree is made up of all kinds of non-tree elements. Like what we think a tree is, is just one little slice that is held together by our mind uh, of what treeness is. If we really want to encounter the tree, we have to let go of any idea of the tree. Because everything that doesn't show up as the tree is involved in the tree being there. So that's the not a tree. A tree is not a tree. And miraculously, in that situation, a tree just shows up. A tree's there. It's not a problem that there's a tree. Not at all. The fact of the tree is the reason that we can share. The emptiness, this is an emptiness teaching, 
or I've been calling it a wholeness teaching sometimes, it's not abstract. It's not like, oh, there aren't any, really any trees. Trees are just in your mind. So, I don't know. We can't do anything. It's not like that at all. It's saying, no, the actual thing you're meeting, the tree, that if you run at it hard, you will run into and bounce off. I've done that before. That's, don't recommend it. Or if you like skiing or something, sometimes people do that, right? You, know, you can't just think the tree away. It's there. It's there. And it being there is how it is that we can share. Me being here is how it is that I can share with you what understanding I have of the Dharma. I have to step forward in, in my, own, um, my own weakness, whatever measure of confidence I have in that. No, I can offer it to you. I have to show up to do that. I mean, if I'm the one who's giving the teaching, I have to show up to do that. So the tree not being a tree is the very way that a tree can do tree. It's just not a object for us to grab onto as a tree. It's a living, dynamic um, being. So this is what's happening in the dedication of merit, is a deep realization of that. When I practice, either things that look very Buddhisty or things that don't look Buddhisty, that are actualizing our interdependence, the merit that arises from that, as I dedicate it to other beings, it's staying alive because it's recognizing I can't hold it. It can't be located in this thing that isn't even here exactly. It's not a container. I can't contain it. It is the actualization that uh, I am not me. Therefore, uh, I'm me. So the giving and receiving that we can do as embodied beings um, is the wholeness. It is the emptiness. We don't try to get rid of everything so we can experience emptiness. We just offer. Just offer. That's emptiness. That's the actualization of emptiness. Just receive. When you practice this dedication, there is immediately a different world. When you dedicate the merit, there is immediately a different world. And you can experience that, or you can actualize that. Experience always is a little bit like consumptive to me. Like you're gonna get the experience, you're gonna get the experience. What I'm saying is you will make it so. This is why Dogen Zenji always uh, emphasize that practice and realization can't be separated. You're not going to practice and then later on wake up. He's saying the practice itself has to be waking up. And the waking up has to be practice. You can't, you can't divide the two. So that's exactly true with the dedication of merit, with the generosity that is actualized through dedicating merit. The whole world changes. The gates of hell are thrown open and all the beings move you know, at once. So I encourage you um, to take up this practice as um, Jizo Bodhisattva in a previous incarnation did, uh, as Mokuren did, as um, the heirs to the uh, Buddha's Dharma for generations after generations have, have done. Not to think of it as a lower thing, but think of it as very central to what it is that we're what it is that we're up to. I mean a practical advice about how to do this, I said it's simple, right? Just do it. Um, but it can be helpful to have some forms. You don't have to use those forms. You can just do like what I did, just say what you want, or say in your head. Or even just move it as an, a feeling or an intention. But you can also do something. Right? You can burn incense, for example. Um, for many people, that, that helps to focus. What am I doing? I'm burning incense. I'm making an offering. 
right? And in that offering, there's merit, but there's also merit in everything that comes together for me to offer that stick of incense. And then I can dedicate the merit. It's really, it's really important. You don't have to wait for someone to die to do that for them. But that's often the times that people practice that the most vigorously. Because you don't know how to make an offering to the person in another way. Because they're not embodied here in the way they were before. So you, you put your hands together. Maybe recite a sutra. Or maybe read a poem. Or say a prayer. It doesn't have to be... Um, you know, it doesn't have to be some particular thing. It has to be what matters to you because that's where the merit will come from. And then uh, after doing that, you simply state, I dedicate the merit too. You can chant it like we do here. You know, go, I dedicate the merit of ba 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 to ba 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 And then usually we end, may we, together with all beings, realize the Buddha way. So that the dedication isn't just between, like I am dedicating the merit to this, but act, this is about everyone's waking up. This is about everyone's waking up. It's always about that. It's always about everyone waking up. That's why if you listen to the dedications of merit when we're doing a chanting service, at the end, almost always ends with that line. May we together with all beings realize the, the way, and then we chant some names of the Buddhas. Um, some people, you know, will like to have a photograph. I have a photograph of somebody that you know is in, um, uh, in difficulty and put it on your altar. After you sit meditation, we don't, we don't emphasize that so much in this tradition, but particularly in Vajrayana, Tibetan Vajrayana traditions, you dedicate after every, every time you meditate, you, you dedicate the merit. Right? You take some time to, to do that. Um, this is a little bit like prayer, but rather than you kind of supplicating yourself to a deity and asking for them to um, intercede on your behalf, I know that's not all how prayer is, I'm not saying that, but, but rather than that kind of a dynamic, what you're doing is you're saying, I am actualizing the Buddha way through this practice. Any practice I do which helps to actualize the Buddha way, to make the way of awakening real, anything I do, that Buddhahood, that, uh, the quality of that Buddhahood we call merit. And so I'm dedicating that. There's, no, there's not an intermediary exactly. There's just the fact of our, uh, the fact of our lives. And as we, as we take up that practice in a very straightforward, practical way, um, uh, the suffering of the world becomes clearer. That's hard. Um, but uh, we also start to see ways in which that suffering can be um, unlocked. So please, take up, uh, take up that practice um, in a way that, that seems um, congruent for you. And... Um, uh, as we start to talk about generosity in other ways, um, keep that most, most um, let's say, fundamental way of thinking about it at the base. Because we get caught up in the materiality so quickly that this, this, this merit is really the underlying um, principle of, of generosity. Anyone has any questions or comments? If you're outside and you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you come to the threshold here so the Jisha um, Kogan can point this microphone at you and uh, then everyone can hear online as well. Um, if in the hall you can just speak or if you're online, uh, just uh, speak up and Stefan will um, do the magic to keep us connected. Hi. I'm like holding some kind of conundrum of uh, I feel like for myself I came here 
in a consumptive way. Mm -hmm. I came here to get something mm -hmm. and bring it in. Yeah. Um, and so, like, but I'm still here, even though it doesn't seem like I get to I get that. <laughs> How do you feel about it now? Uh, it feels really nice to like letting go of that, mm -hmm. like that uh, that grasping was the sort of suffering. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So uh, Joichi was saying that he's the coming here to get some to get something and not getting it, but also feeling the release of not feeling like you have to get it. Yeah at least for yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think to me that, that's what captured my heart in, um, in, the, in the Mahayana. Mm -hmm. Was I so deeply wanted to be awakened. And what that meant to me was that I would know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, I love that about this tradition. It says, great, you want to know? Dive in. <laughs> because actually you can. But you can't know in the way that you know you know and others don't know that you will hoard that knowing for yourself that's not the kind of knowing we're talking about but there's a there's a point where that's the only way we can understand it we want to get it right so the buddha gives us a um a path it says you want to get it do this but as you start to get it what you realize is it's not about what you thought it was about or it's at least it's not constricted in the way that you had a constricted way of thinking about it so so the Sometimes I think about like the sprout that pops up from the earth, what they must be feeling, you know, oh, space. <laughs> like you've been a seed, right? You know, which is, you know, so groovy. Um, and then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, space, distance, all of this kind of thing. So a different, a different world emerges through that. And I think generosity, I feel very uh, lucky to have um, met um, many, many very generous people in my life. And, um, and so I don't feel like I knew how to do that. But then as, as I, as I um, was in relation with that generosity, I could feel the truth of it. And so the wheel that was turning there, a wheel inside of me could also turn. And then I realized the wheel that was turning inside of me wasn't really different than the wheel that was turning inside of those people who were so immensely generous. It was one wheel and we were all there. Um, Hi. Um, I'm really nervous for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, cause I don't know if I have a question. Okay. But when I listen to teachings on generosity, um, and I hear share our strength, mm -hmm. uh, I can't unplug that from relationships of power. Mm -hmm. and I wonder how how um, gendered this teaching is throughout time and how um, how we can um, see the teaching more in wholeness and less from a um, a power of giving and receiving and that middle place, that place. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm always suspicious when I hear share our strength because mm -hmm. um, really in generosity sometimes we need to share our weakness mm -hmm. and that is um, kind of un-American or like un-American then right that we, have, we really struggle with sharing our weaknesses and um, hearing the truth of that. Um, I'm wondering how we can see this um, from that power dynamic and that gendered perspective of giving and receiving. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, 
I think you, I think the strength can be a really, um, can be a really problematic word if we hear it in terms of, um, like fortification. How is it that I, um, am, um, occupy space in the world and carry power? Um, I don't, I don't think about this word in that way, uh, that, that our strength, uh, depending on the situation, comes in many different uh, kinds of um, uh, many different kinds of uh, expressions, uh, and that the 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 movement is exactly what you're saying. The movement is from thinking about us as being separate beings, and how am I going to share my strength with you? To realizing that there aren't really two separate beings here, or whatever the numbers are. And, um, and that movement can oftentimes uh, take, um, I think you said it very well, can take sharing the strength of our own weakness, sharing our own vulnerability. That's also our, that also can be our strength. Um, and there's a way in which we may emphasize uh, too much like, okay, I, I can do it. I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. Um, uh, but what I'm saying here, or what I'm trying to say is, that the receiving is equally uh, is important. And that receiving is also our offering um, to others, to be willing to receive, to be able to receive, um, is also a way in which we uh, are sharing our strength with others. Reiko, what have you, what have you found in terms of the, um, of this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, practice of generosity that really uh, resonates for you? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I, I, um, I practice with it a lot and um, as as a single mom, it's um, it's a really challenging practice. But um, as a gendered woman, I, I feel like I'm gendered to receive. But as um, a mother, I am um, a giver. And um, and as a standalone practice, like under one roof. With kids. Mm -hmm. um, giving and receiving is really, really intense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I struggle with um, connecting with the rest of the world in generosity because I feel, and especially um, under COVID conditions and being isolated, it's hard to experience. Um, the mutuality of generosity with the rest of the world. And I practice that in my garden. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever um, taken this practice of dedicating the merit of that um, garden work to someone or some group of people or things or beings? Mm, not enough. I think I forget. Because yeah. I think there's, there's, that's one of the things I'm trying to present here in this terms of dedication of merit is this isn't about I have something and I'm going to give it to, to someone else. This is about the actualizing that there really isn't anybody else in the first place. And so that can happen in a very simple way. Whatever merit is moving through our life, we can dedicate, we can dedicate that merit. And again, we can do it in explicit ways by, by chanting or meditating or those kinds of things or doing good works. But we can also um, do it simply by recognizing the merit that comes through our life of practice in a very broad sense. And, um, and uh, the, this uh, fundamental quality of where generosity springs from, it lives there. 
and the the grosser forms of generosity um, I don't mean I mean gross in terms of like less fundamental um, if they're not centered on that on this principle then th they're uh, they're weak they're not really um, they don't have the real full strength of the merit uh, so I'd encourage you to to do that practice question about volunteer work mm -hmm. and how to engage in what feels generous at the start but sometimes can become tense I think um, advocating for any group and getting involved in public policy and things mm -hmm. like that there's a lot of debate and disagreement mm -hmm. and I think there's some tension that comes up with feeling like I have something to give. Mm -hmm. I think I know what's the right thing to do mm -hmm. and getting more and more tense about that idea. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you maintain the generosity that you start off with throughout the whole process? And how do you recognize when it's becoming too tense and too personal and mm -hmm. narrow? Dedicate merit. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't want to be fl flippant about it in any way, but this is just exactly the reason for this kind of practice. I mean, this practice meets that uh, so perfectly in my experience, because what happens in what, in what you're describing is that tension happens is there's all these players, and there's different power dynamics, and there's different um, understandings, and different uh, motivations, different ideas about what actually would be the best thing, what would act actualize our interdependence. We all have a different way of thinking about that. So you get in the middle of that and yourself and other beings start to become more and more two-dimensional. We start thinking that we know what the tree is, right? Like, I know what moxie is. I know who moxie is. Like, if I think that, I've already lost, right? And so as, a, as beings become two-dimensional to us in that way, a dedication of merit um, is a real medicine for that. So you dedicate merit for that group or dedicate merit for a particular person where that tension is, is happening um, uh, that you're experiencing or you're seeing in their suffering. And as you do that, like I say, a different world appears. And that world um, can tell us something about uh, how, to, how to navigate. Um, I'm not saying that's the, like, that's the entire solution, but as far as practice goes, that's really, I think, is a very, very central. It leads to things, I think, like being able to um, feel more, uh, what's the word? feel more completely where our own place for rest is. Because in that place where things are becoming two dimensional, it's put like, I want to give this to you. I want to give this to you. I want to give this to you. I don't want it. I don't want it. <laughs> right, right. And then you're in this dynamic. But when you dedicate merit, it helps you also feel the place where you're like, okay, maybe I need to rest for a second. And there's and then there's a rhythm. Um, and my experience has been that uh, I I rarely go into things with as clean of a karmic slate as I think I am um, on the surface. And so when you're actually there engaging in it, that's one of the beautiful things about being alive is as you engage it, you start to see the karma that lives in you that's revealed by engaging whatever that situation is. And as that's revealed, mm -hmm. the undoing of that karma is what our, you know, is what our practice is about. Um, not just the like, the whether the gift we thought we could give, we actually could in the way we thought we could give it. That's changing, you know, because it has to change with the karmic um, situation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for doing the work that you do. Hey, Joe, I have uh -huh. kind of a curiosity that uh, maybe you can help unpack. Um, I'm having the opportunity to, to cook um, quite a bit mm -hmm. in this community. Uh, something very powerful um, uh, 
that is very disturbing to people. Like maybe one of the most disturbing things um, is, is when we don't express verbal gratitude to each other mm. for cooking. Mm -hmm. People really want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and whenever we say, oh, you know, that's not necessary, or that's, that's not quite the practice we have, right. it's very disturbing, upsetting almost. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, why do you think that's the case? What is it about? That's just why it's disturbing? Why does it seem disturbing? Mm. Uh, what does it, or what does it knock off balance? Then? Yeah, well, I think a number of things. One is, is habit. And um, we care about other people, and we want them to f feel um, our appreciation, which all of, all of which are wholesome things. So I think there is a kind of that practice of just uh, thinking uh, in a much broader way than the way that we the way that we do with our chance, rather than thinking that that particular individual person. It um, it actually grates the wrong way on a bunch of things that are pretty wholesome. Right? And so we feel that, like, oh, wait a minute, why? I thought this was, I thought we were, I thought we were trying to be better people, <laughs> and um, and so that 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 grates there. Um, I also think that it can be, not always, but it can be a reflection of our deep uncomfortableness. Is that a word? Uncomfortableness with receiving. A very clean receiving, just very simple receiving for many people is very difficult and so the thanking and the appreciation can really be about thanking and appreciating the person but i think also a lot of times a thanking another person is about relieving some tension that you have about the situation and so and so it's a little bit like when people laugh they're not always laughing because stuff's funny they're laughing because they want to un do something, kind of let let something go. So I think a lot of times that's how it um, how it functions, and um, and to thank the wholeness um, rather than uh, focusing on the individual um, is part of what we're taking up in that practice. And uh, you know, in Japanese, I'm, I keep thinking in like in the when I was in the monastery or when I'm at home or. Uh, um, uh, general places in Japan, there's a term that people say all the time after you eat. And it's ambiguous. Like it doesn't say, it's not like thank you, Jacqueline, for making the food. You say, gochisou sama deshita, which means like um, uh, honorable, 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 you, mm, there was an honorable, person of providing a banquet. <laughs> it's a clumsy translation. But it's not really, it's not like, thank you, Jacqueline, for making this food for me. It's like a, 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 a feast was provided. And, um, and it, it references the, the making of the food, but it doesn't have that exact same, um, that exact same uh, relationship in it. So, uh, uh, Sometimes I feel like after we're eating together, I wish we had a word like that, that we could just say thank you in a broad sense. Um, so maybe we'll come up with something. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll also say we took that habit up, but that people, like, a, like a, it got a little rigid. <laughs> so if you feel like thanking someone for some food they made, that's great. We don't have to. We don't have to hold that with a kind of rigidity. It's just that that part where, if the habit is to always thank, then it can be hard to recognize that other way in which the thanks is a carrier for this other kind of tension, and um, just like the same way we don't talk a lot about the food with each other. We don't say. There's for people here. If you're here for, I mean, right now with COVID, this isn't happening very much, but with the broader community. Um, but you know, we don't we don't comment too much on the on, on the food. Yeah, that's also freaks people out. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.